Hi. So uh, today's talk is, is about uh, how to use functional reactive programming without all that black magic attached, thing, like in Reactive Coco and all that other languages we have. Um, so agenda. when you first and saw the talk on the agenda, I guess you've seen like, oh, that's a pretty long title. It's like the longest title for today. And actually, my intention was I just wanted to see if actually the server crashes if I want to, if I have a so long line. Um, so the idea is always poke around in code and see what other people are doing and how they are implementing stuff. And that was actually the idea to do this talk. So I always wanted to get in touch with Reactive Coco, but I never had the time to do so. And when I had the time, it wasn't so convincing of all those macros and the objective C. And so Swift came out, and I just wanted to give it a fresh start. So first, some stuff about me. So my name is Jens. Um, I'm also one of the organizers of the Swift Berlin Meetup. So if you ever are interested in uh, Swift here in Berlin, just come to our next meetup, which should be somewhere in the beginning of June. Um, also, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, uh, and my uh, company's website called notgeschoss.de. Um, but mostly that's about it. Uh, so let's come to actually some code and some reactive, uh, reactivity. So at first, a short introduction to functional programming, the universe, and everything. So sometimes you want to learn a, bit, a little bit about a new topic. And if you want to learn about a new topic, mostly it's interesting to look at something old, something you already know. So in the beginning, McIlroy created the Unix pie, and he saw it was good. Like, you have different little programs, you have processes, you pipe things into each other, you have error handling built in. So if an error occurs, just stop, do not continue, do strange stuff, just stop, give me an error, tell me. So we have the standard in, standard out, the, uh, the error out. And actually, that's everything you need to know about functional programming, at least as an object-oriented developer. So mostly, that's it. So let's think about how we can do something as elegant as the Unix pipe in our own code. So let's talk about application architecture, which, which might be a little bit better than this one. So um, somewhere last year, there was a book called Functional Programming in Swift. Um, so the moment it came out, it just felt like two nights for me uh, without sleeping because I wanted to know everything. And it was so great until one point there was this scary M word called Monad. So I was an object-oriented developer. I was always quite, pro uh, quite pragmatic about everything. And then I had to learn about Monads. So I, I took a look at Wikipedia, I took, uh, took a look at different tutorials, and they had all those nice ideas, but mm, maybe not. So let's continue to something else first. So Swift gives us a chance to start from a blank slate, which might be a good thing or not, but at least it's a great idea to experiment around. So there are no best practices yet. We, don't, we are not get really sure how this will end. Just let's give it a try, and let's see what happens. So maybe it will go wrong, maybe not. Let's just try. So the whole idea was for reactive functional programming. Just implement your own, and then you will understand it. Just like on yesterday's talk about the uh, monads, it was you have to implement your own monad to actually understand what a monad is. And the moment you understand it, it, it gets really hard to explain. But let, let's try. So there was on this application, while I was trying to crash the server, this last sentence was, which was, and I promise not to use the scary M word which was like 12 weeks ago. So I have to uh, make a little confession um, that was a lie. So first part is actually about monads. And actually how to train your monad. Everyone wants a monad, and everyone wants to expand what a monad can, or actually want to know what a monad actually is. Uh, but let's just move that a little bit away. Uh, there was this really nice explanation from a metamission, metamission uh, all told, a monad is just a monad in the category of endofunctors. Oh, no, I know it. That's easy. No, it's not. Something ever, uh, else. Monads are just applicative functors. Mm, slightly better, not that good. Just mm, let us take a look at back where we want to go. So we have this producer of content, LS, which is piped into 
something which transforms it, and then piped to something that sorts the result. Well, that's something I can understand. That is no endofunctors, no functors, whatever. Uh, so that's pretty OK. Um, let's take, a lo take another example. So maybe you know this song by Daft Punk, buy it, use it, break it, fix it. Well, actually, that is not so nice as a programmer. So as a programmer, it was, would more look like this. You have error handling in between. You have piping of results somewhere else. So in the end, you have this pyramid of doom going to the right side of your monitor. Um, it's not so nice. But actually, what you want to write is something like this. And maybe in the means of this. So using pipes, taking the result of something, put it somewhere else, and somehow magically solve the error handling in between. So that actually is what a monad is about. So you have something that produces something which might be a result, which might be a failure. Maybe there's an error. You have to handle it. Then you go to the next step. So that's actually everything that is about. So you have a monad. And a monad is basically something that has map and bind. Or mostly, uh, sometimes bind is also called flat map. So just think of it as a box. So you have like this nice little box, and something may be in there. And then you map it, map it. So mapping is like you take it out of the box, apply something to it, take it back in, and that's it. So just like your shiny new Apple Watch box, you open it, you do something about it, put it back in, that's it. Maybe you have installed something. Um, but sometimes this do something with it goes wrong. So you're doing a network request, you're doing parsing. It can go wrong, so there's an error. And actually caring about that error gives, in the end, an optional. So if, if you think about uh, a monad as an optional, so you have this box, you open it, something goes wrong, and you put an optional into your optional, which isn't that great. So uh, that's like this American uh, TV series, like we put an optional into your optional because we heard you liked optionals. Um, we don't want to do that, and that is actually what bind is about. We take this box, take our value, do something with it. If it fails, we have an empty box. If it's successful, we have a box with something in it. That's actually it. And that's all you have to know about a monad. Um, so let's see some code. We all like code. So the easiest optional we can get, or the easiest monad, is one defined from the optional. So we have an optional string, which in this case, actually has a word. Uh, and we have a function which just takes that and uh, does hello world with it. So uh, mapping on optionals is actually built in, which became quite surprising to me. So mapping optional is actually like mapping an array. An array is a box of values. You take the, uh, you take the values out. You map something with them. You, pack, uh, you put them back in an array. An optional is mostly the same. So box open, do something, put it back in. Um, what's missing on, a, on an optional is the bind method. So if we have something, maybe we have a greeter which is a little bit more picky, which only greets if it's word or a country, but not for certain people. So this kind of root greeting function would just return an optional string. So maybe it's a greeting, maybe it's nothing because it's not greeting to that person. So um, then we would have an optional optional string, which is kind of bulky to handle, and we don't want that. So how would, look in, uh, how would a bind function look on that? So we have a function which takes the value. In this case, it would be a string, and makes an optional value of it. So that's the difference to, to the map. Um, and in the end, you, you have an optional. So that's actually pretty easy. So we have this, implicit, uh, we have this uh, explicit unwrapping uh, via if let. Uh, so actually, we apply the function, and if the function has a result, we return that. Otherwise, we return nil. So this is actually our first monad in six lines of code. Um, there is some special syntax for optionals in Swift, and that makes it a little bit hard to transfer that knowledge to later knowledge. So let's write it a little bit different. But first, an example. Uh, we have this. Picky thing, greet or nil. So either if we are addressing the world, we say hello world. Otherwise, we say nil. Uh, so if, if we uh, use bind with greet or nil, in the end, we will have an optional string and not an optional of an, of an optional string. So that might come in handy. 
Um, so just transforming this to another syntax. So instead of using all this syntactic sugar we have for optionals, let's take the, uh, let's take the normal step. So an optional is an enum, an enum with a value or none, which is nil. So we can actually switch on self, um, then do pattern matching to get the value, return the value applied by the function, which will return an optional, which we want to return, or just return nil. So actually both uh, extensions do the exact same thing, just different syntax. But we will use the uh, letter syntax for, for our next examples. So let's see the next monad. We have already seen that yesterday, so we will make that a little bit shorter. Um, we have a result which might have a success. That's like the sum value of optionals. Uh, and we have the error case where we have an error. That, uh, that comes in handy if, uh, if you have an optional and an optional in the error case is nil. That is okay for the happy coding path, but normally if you want to do error handling, you have to have an error. So let's just do like an optional plus error, which is our result. And our result is uh, generic, so we can put some object in there and get it out later. So we remember for having a monad, you have to support map and we have to support bind. So let's just implement that. Map, pretty easy. Uh, if success, just unwrap that stuff and put it back into the box. In this, kind, uh, in this case, actually called box. So uh, in, in a lot of implementations, you see this box class, uh, and mostly it's not really explained. Uh, the idea is just there is currently some limitations in the compiler which do not allow um, variable structs in, uh, in uh, enums. So if you have an attached value to an enum, it has to be in, in a struct, so the size is known up front. I hope that will be re uh, later re uh, um, fixed in the language, but currently we have just to cape that. So just ignore the box and just think of it, uh, think of, think of it as like an identity transform. So map was pretty easy. Uh, let's do the bind. Uh, bind, so we have a transform function which goes from one value to the result of another value. Uh, and again, if we have a value applied, we go to the function of our value. Otherwise, we just uh, get the error to the next part of, uh, of our chain. So just comparing that with what we have built. So imagine ls would return a result type. So either it would be an array of lines, or it would be an error like you're not in a dictionary, world is on fire, whatever. And then we have this thing in between which does the calculation, like if there is a value, use the next function on that value, otherwise just get that error next to our next uh, step in our line. So if there is an error and ls reports an error, it will get just straight ahead to the end of the line and you will get, will get notified, well, there is an error and we have shortcutted everything in between. So that's what we already have. So everything, uh, everything is synchronous by now. Um, let's see some examples of transforms in Swift. So a transforming function is something that takes a value, does something with it, and then wraps it in a box. So either it is successful or it's not like parsing a string from data. That might, success, uh, that might be successful if that data is actually a string. But if you put an image in there, that will fail. So we can say, oh, that's an image, don't parse it. It's result of error. Something else is parsing JSON. So you have data, and you want to have a dictionary of string to any object which contains whatever. Uh, so there might be an error like this NSJSON serialization which gives you an error. You can just wrap that in a result and either you get the dictionary or the parsing error. This actually gets completely rid of the uh, in-out parameters for, for errors. But there is this kind of transformation function which just doesn't fit in so well and that is something that's asynchronous. So you have this kind of transformation which will take some time, maybe it's on a different thread, maybe we are dependent on some external API which has a completion call. So this is a little bit strange and this doesn't fit into all the monad stuff we heard so far. So that's why I propose to just extend our bind method a little bit. So we put a value in and we get a value out, but 
later on. So this still sounds like, uh, like bind. So just, just implement it. So this looks a little bit scary, but don't worry, it will get more scary. Um, we have a function which takes a parameter like our string, then we process it, then we have result to void, which is our completion handler, and the result will be another transformed, or will, will be another completion handler which has the result as an argument. Looks pretty scary, we will see an example soon. It's pretty easy if you use it. Writing it is a little bit harder, but using it is pretty easy. So what do we, do we want re to return? We want to return a function which, when it gets called, has a parameter of result. So that's what the last part of the definition is. So that's pretty easy. We use the Swift uh, closure syntax. We return a function with a parameter. That parameter is result of u. Um, and then we do a switch on self. So if we are self successful, then we will use that function, which is like f of the value. And the second parameter of that function, as we see, is a, is, is a completion block, which had the same uh, signature as the method above, so we can just pass it in. That's what this f of uh, v and g is. Uh, or if there's an error, we just call the error completion handler of our function. So this is like the most scary thing we have to see right now, but it's mostly just the same thing we had before, just asynchronous. So that's where the next idea came up. Um, so if we have all this binding thing, we are already pretty close to Reactive Coco. Reactive Coco has signals, futures, all that stuff, but actually we are almost there. We already have asynchronous results. So let's stay, uh, stay, uh, take it one step further, we, uh, and I have just created this small framework called Interstellar, it's on GitHub, um, which does mostly this thing. So we have this binding chain of functions in between, but we are not only uh, doing it once, we will do it several times. So that's actually the difference to futures and promises you've heard about before. Uh, a future is executed once. So you put something in, it gets transformed several times, and you get something out, and that's it, and you let go. A signal is a little bit different. A signal is executed several times. So every time something changes, we go through the whole method chain, and in the end, we get something out. So let's implement that stuff. So we have this class, so this time it's actually a class, um, of signal, and signal contains something, like a string, an array, an array of strings, uh, everything you can imagine. So it has a value which acts mostly like a catch. Uh, we have a list of callbacks, so uh, other uh, objects which are interested in changes in the, in the signal can attach to the callbacks, and that's via subscribe. To, so to subscribe, you pass in a completion block which as a first argument has the result you're interested in. And as like a short bonus, if there already is a value, that, is, that completion block is uh, evaluated immediately. So it mostly works like you attach to a signal, and then every time something changes, you get notified. Just think of um, a UI text view. On the UI text view, you have um, like a text signal attached. And then uh, every time you change the text in the text view, you get notified by the signal. And then you can process this and do stuff with it. The other function is update. So sometimes something has to change in the signal. And then you can just put a value in that signal. And then it will just notify everyone else. So again, we want to have it as a monad, so we define map and bind. We are pretty used to it already. So um, mapping is like we have a signal of string, and we want to have a signal of another type after processing. So we have that signal, we create a new signal we, which we want to return, and we subscribe that new signal to the old signal. So maybe that's a little bit confusing, but mostly it's just if one signal changes, it notifies the next signal in the change, to do whatever transforming it wants to do. Uh, so we are actually using just the subscribe method we defined above. Yeah. Uh, same for the bind. Bind is pretty similar. Um, if we want to execute the next step in our chain, the signal does the transformation, notifies the next signal, which 
does some transformation, notifies the next one. So actually, everything is happen, happening in the callback blocks. What's interesting about that is, so far, we haven't defined so many types. So these transformation functions are pretty vague. They have to define this signature, but actually, that's everything about it. So if you think about um, framework methods in UIKit in different parts of the system, you actually will find those method signatures and different parts, like you supply some parameters and a callback at, uh, as the last argument. Uh, so if, you, if you're used to a llama fire, that's mostly how the arguments are there. Um, most libraries work that way. So actually, it's pretty easy to just chain those functions later on together. Um, and again, the asynchronous bind. Uh, so we have this function of a parameter and the result plot block, um, and then we apply that transformation to the next signal. So again, it's just signal, transform, signal, transform, and we build this chain. So in the end, it's more like pushing instead of pulling. Uh, so if, if you think of, uh, your, of your usual UI view controller, you have this view did load, and then you're transforming all that stuff, and then you display it, and you get notified, and you pull again. Uh, this is more like you have the signal, and you listen on every part of the signal you're interested in. So you have like a signal of your favorite uh, model you're interested in, and in the end, you have a completion block which just uh, displays it on your table view. So there's one thing missing to annoy the audience, and that is custom operators. Um, so everything we've seen so far is completely possible without those operators. So they are just optional, kind of. Um, so we define one operator, and that's like the tricky part of it, which is multiply, uh, multiple times overloaded. So we, th we start with a normal map, like putting it, transforming it, and putting it back, then the bind method, taking it, transforming it, if it's successful, put it back, and the same for the asynchronous thing again. So what do we gain from overloaded operators in that part? Uh, well, the great thing is we don't have to care anymore if the result is, or if, if the transform function we want to have, if it is asynchronous, if it's synchronous, if it's a map, or if it's a bind, we don't have to care. We take all our functions, which are kind of one of the, uh, one of the uh, transforms, and just chain them together with our operators. And what we get then is, here we started, that's what we wanted to, do, to achieve, this is what we actually have now. And that is actually Swift code. Um, so chaining, chaining together trans, uh, transforms is pretty interesting as you don't have to care about error handling. So it's actually working the same as, as the example above. You have those functions, you put something in, if there's an error, just shortcut to the end. But there's one thing missing, which is in Reactive Cocoa, and that is threading. So normally, a signal is attached to a thread and will always execute on that thread. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that, so I thought about how can we change that. And that's actually pretty easy. So if, if you think of changing a thread just as a transform, like you transform an object from one thread to an object of another thread, well, then it gets pretty easy. So um, let's define a function called main, and main does something like putting an object and putting it on the main thread. And that's actually pretty easy. So you, have, you get a type in, and in the end, you call the completion. It's just an asynchronous map. Same for background. So if you want to go to a background thread, take that object, make a new one, put it in a signal on another thread. So um, now we can just do all this thread hopping without doing callback blocks, which looks pretty nice. Something else you might see in here is that we use a caret function for the background thread. So if you ever wanted to have a useful thing for, a background, uh, for, for caret functions, here is one. Uh, so you can attach a queue uh, to the function, so it's part partly evaluated. And then later on, when the actual value goes through, then the whole function is evaluated. So that might be pretty handy. Um, so there's one thing missing, and this is where uh, Reactive Cocoa really shines instead of this small library, that is extending UIKit. So we have this nice thick signals, we know how to transform them, we know how to use them, but where do we get them from? And that is normally user input. 
So user input, network input, all those values have to come from somewhere. So um, that might be a text field changing. That might be the result of a, uh, of a search field. That might be a scroll event. That might be a tab event. Everything like that is a signal. So let's try it with the text field. So the great thing is this, is, uh, this has only to be done once. So if you import a library which produces a signal, you're pretty much, uh, you're pretty much done. So a text signal um, is just a signal of type string. So we produce it with let signal. And then we uh, use associated objects, as we have seen before today. Um, so if that is a signal, we just use it. Otherwise, we create that signal uh, at, us, uh, at the text field itself as an observer to itself, and then just return the signal uh, when the text field has changed. Um, so this is pretty ugly, but the great thing is once you have hidden all that ugly code in a signal, it becomes pretty nice. That's mostly what uh, monads are about, most, mostly used by programmers to hide the ugly parts in the code. So ugly input, output, that's pretty nice to do that as a monad. Um, and mostly, if it's a variable, it qualifies to be a signal. So if something is going to change over time, it will be a variable. Otherwise, you would have defined it as a let. And if it will change over time, well, then you can make it a signal. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is this is not an all or nothing approach. So normally, some, uh, normally the mindset about reactive cocoa is like, I have to use it everywhere or nowhere. But actually, you can use signals if you, want their, uh, if, if you want to be them at that place, or you just move them somewhere else, or just use one signal in the whole application. That's fine as well. Uh, so let's do some example. So after reactive cocoa, next is reactive kitten. And it's about GIFs and cats and GIFs of cats. And mostly, it's just a Giphy client. Uh, so let's write that with this implementation. Um, so normally, this is all about transforms. So we, we talked about the monads before. Now we talk about the transforms. So how do we get something the user searches for as GIFs? So the user is typing, which will be kind of a text signal on whatever UI cat element. Then we take that, what's in there, transform it to a URL, like search URL for Giphy. Then we take that into NSURL session, load that request. Then we pass that data into JSON and into strongly typed objects. And then we put that back on the main thread, because loading request goes to the back uh, background. And then we display that in a table view. So this is actually Swift code. And it's like really readable what your program is doing. So you define all those little steps. And in the end, you put it together in a signal chain. And you get like a cat signal out of it. Um, what's interesting also is some of these methods will always work, like create URL. It's just appending a search parameter. parameter. Uh, something can fail, like loading a request, parsing data. Uh, so we don't have to care if it's bind, if it's map, if it's asynchronous, we just put it together, and in the end, it will work. So the bigger one is like how to request something from a path and then do the completion. So we do this URL thing. We create a request. Uh, we use NSURL session to do that. Um, then we uh, just download it. We have a completion block. And in the end, we call our own completion with the result of what we have done. So maybe the status has gone wrong. Then we do a network error. Uh, maybe uh, there is no status code at all because it's not uh, HTTP response. Then it's network error. Uh, maybe we don't get a response at all because the user is offline. Then it's, again, a network error. We don't have to handle the error here. We just put it in the chain and let the end user decide what he wants to do about it. So actually, this is code with error handling, completely done, which is, I think, the best part of using signals and monads. Uh, you don't have to care at, for errors at every single step. You care at the, for them at the end. So next thing is parsing JSON. That's a little bit shorter. That should also be a little bit easier. Um, so you just call the JSON serialization. If it works, it's a success. If it fails, it's an error. So next part of, of our chain. And let's try something else. Now we have the table view. We have a single image. We want to load a single image 
later on in like a detail view. Uh, so we have this GIF signal of the data, uh, detail view where we put the GIF object in, we get the URL from the object, we go through the background, uh, we try to load it from cache, then we retry from the network if that fails, and then we go to, back to the main thread, and actually this is image downloading code uh, with retry errors, everything in between. So how do we use that in a view controller? Well, it's pretty easy. Just instead of having an array, we have a signal of an array of GIFs. So we have this uh, search bar. The search bar has a text signal. I just extended your iCAD for that. And uh, then we just pipe it into a function and into the next function. And then in the end, we have a new signal. And this new signal, uh, so uh, the search bar text signal is a signal of type string. Then we pipe it through the network. Then it's a type of um, array of GIF. And then we pipe it through uh, to the main thread. It's still an array of GIF, so that's what our signal is. And we just have to attach to that. And this is actually how it looks in the end. Uh, so the signal is triggered the moment you click on Enter or on, on the keyboard. It's not visible in here. Uh, so we download the network. Uh, we uh, download the JSON. We parse it. We pipe it back to the table view. And the signal actually can answer most questions the table view data source has. So pretty easy. You can find the whole code actually on GitHub. Uh, I just published it. Um, uh, you don't have to remember the whole URL. I only have three public repos, so that should be easy to find. Um, yeah, that's mostly it about that app. So let's do a short outlook. How, so what's next? What do we want to accomplish next? Well, something you should read about if you're interested in all that monad talking is this article called Functures, Applicatives, and Monads in Pictures. And that's just the best intro I've ever had to monads. Um, it's actually explaining stuff by piping things to graphics. Um, and it's, it's really visual. It's really nice to see. Um, so normally after that one, you will get monads and after implementing one of your own. Uh, another article which is really interesting is like the introduction to, uh, to reactive programming you've been missing. Uh, it's uh, just a gist on GitHub. And um, it's mostly written in JavaScript, so, mm -hmm, but uh, all the graphics and the explanations are really great. Uh, I think there's also a port to Swift. I've seen it somewhere, but I didn't find the URL again. Um, also, Reactive Cocoa 3 is upcoming. I think it's close to release now. And uh, they are embracing all the changes in Swift. They are doing generics, pattern matching. So mostly what I showed today will be at least partly applied in Reactive Cocoa 3 when it's finally more compatible with Swift and we finally get rid of all the ugly Objective-C macros we had before. So uh, Objective, uh, 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 Reactive Cocoa 3 should be pretty interesting for you. Um, but actually, you don't have to use that one because there are so many alternative implementations. There's RX Swift, uh, which is a part of uh, Microsoft Reactive Extensions to Swift. Um, although it's called Microsoft, it's pretty interesting. Um, and also, yesterday, we heard about uh, DeLorean from Junior. Um, so that's pretty interesting as well. That's more about futures and promises, but uh, they, they are pretty close to Signal. So Signal is like just a future that is called several times. Uh, and also, this project is uh, available in Carthage. Um, my idea was to open source it next week when it's done. Uh, but after hearing um, the uh, talk yesterday by Ash Furrow, uh, I was like a little bit overhand and, put the, uh, and, and uh, clicked the publish button really, really early. So um, now there's no documentation yet. There's no README yet. Uh, so let's just take this presentation um, as a README. But everyone is welcome to do pull requests and to enhance it uh, uh, later on. And if you want to make Swift crash, this is really the best idea. Because uh, I, somewhere in between, like on the second bind method, I decided to code everything in sublime text um, because Swift was constantly crashing source kit. And, and in, in Sublime, I at least had uh, indentation and syntax highlighting. So that worked a little bit better. The great thing is, once that thing is compiled into a framework, Swift is not uh, the uh, source code is not crashing anymore. So from that moment on, it's uh, pretty happy. So mostly that's it. So thank you. And <laughs> questions?
Thank you.